I will be talking about the basics of partnerships, and let me just start with a connection to the bigger picture. So why do we need uh, Monte Carlo event generators? We have heard this already. But this is basically, uh, on one side, we have the theory described in uh, terms of QFT and Lagrangians. But on the other side, we have experiments, so collider experiments with very complex detectors, like the LHC with ATLAS and CMS. And they reconstruct individual events. And uh, these are basically very advanced counting experiments with uh, these complex event outcomes. And uh, the reason we need Monte Carlo event generators is that we want to simulate the theory that we know how it looks like um, to a level where we can compare with experiments. So Monte Carlo event generators do a stochastic uh, simulation of the full event. And they eventually allow to compare theory with experiment then. And uh, yeah, so to be precise, they predict an event count, thanks, uh, by integrating differential cross-sections over specific base space regions. So you have seen this picture before, but I'll just show it again. So um, at the core of every event, there's a hard, uh, a hard scattering here depicted in red. And this is what most talks here focus on. But I will now talk about uh, the pattern shower. So attaching additional radiation in the final state here, but also in the initial state on these internal lines that connect the incoming uh, partons to the um, hard process. Now I'll talk a little bit about the heterogenization as well, because when the event uh, arrives in the detector, when the partons arrive in the detector, they will uh, be color neutral, and we somehow need to model this transition to a color neutral state. And uh, yeah, there's more aspects. So these hadrons that are formed here, these color neutral resonances, they will be decaying. And there might also be a rescattering in the final state between these hadrons again. And then also there's a probability of having a multi-parton interaction. So in the same PP collision, there might be other partons also forming a, um, a secondary heart collision. And this needs to be modeled as well, but I will not go into details on this. So just to give you an overview, uh, there are three heavily used Monte Carlo event generator programs uh, for multipurposes. And the oldest one is Pythia. It was developed in Lund, where I'm from. And uh, work on it began in 1978 with uh, heteronization studies. So this actually came from studies of the uh, heteronization in the Lund string model. And uh, Pythia 6, so old versions of Pythia, used a virtuality order shower. I'll explain what that means. But nowadays, Pythia 8 has a PT order shower and employs matrix element corrections. And there's also uh, additional showers in Pythia. So in the latest release from like, two weeks ago, Dyer and Vincia showers are included in Pythia. And uh, something unique about Pythia is also that the multi pattern interaction is implemented in an interleaved model. Then there's Herwig. Work began in 1984. And this one originated from uh, color coherence studies. I'll talk about that as well. And the distinctive feature about Herwig is its angular ordered shower that gets the color uh, coherence right. And uh, it also has a PT ordered Catani Simo dipole shower. And uh, as opposed to Pythia, it uses a cluster heteronization model, not a string heteronization model. And then the third um, generator is uh, Sherpa. The work began in the early 2000s. And this one originated from matrix element and pattern shower matching and merging. And this is what I will talk, be talking about in the second lecture this afternoon. And uh, it also relies on a Catani Zimo dipole uh, shower. And it has the Dyer, another independent implementation of Dyer shower as well. And it also, it's also based on cluster heteronization then, but it's different from Herwig. So a small outline. So in this first lecture this morning, I'll talk about part on showers. That means I'll talk about initial and final state radiation, basically, and the differential equations, the d equations that govern this uh, evolution here. So uh, the part on shower is basically um, um, an evolution from high resolution scales down to low resolution scales uh, in the order of heteronization. And uh, in the second lecture this afternoon, I'll then talk about matching and merging. And this basically means combining the benefits of matrix element, so fixed order calculations, and pattern showers. So merging generally refers to having multiple samples with different numbers of jets and merging them consistently without double counting to imp uh, improve the radiation pattern of a simulation. And matching usually refers to analog matrix elements 
that you attach a part in Shower to. Um, so I have a short list of suggested reading here, and uh, I put uh, a lot of reference into these slides, and they are all clickable. So if you download these slides, you can uh, easily read up on the details if you like. So I uploaded this on Indico. And the first reference is the general purpose event generator for LHC physics review. And this one describes all the physics that goes, basically all the physics that goes into event generation in the various stages. So for the hard process, um, then for the parton shower, for the heteronization. And it also reviews the physics choices that are made in uh, main programs like Pythia, Herwig, Sherpa, and also the Ariadne shower. Then, uh, a reference that is more specific about what I'm talking about is uh, this Introduction to Part and Shower Event Generators from, uh, by Stefan Höcher. Then if you want to get the details, uh, I can recommend the Black Book of Quantum Chromodynamics. It goes into uh, a lot of details, technically, it's a thick book, but uh, there you can look up a lot. And then if you want to uh, see how the physics is actually implemented in the code, uh, in one example, I can recommend the Pythia six physics manual, because there they actually explain in detail how these concepts are implemented in the code. So let me start with the part on shower. So what we want to do is we want to start from a hard process and dress up this process with additional radiation until we reach some sort of cutoff scale. And as an example, I'll start from E plus E minus going to Q, Q bar glue. So a hard process might be E plus E minus just going to two jets, so Q, Q bar. And then the first additional radiation that might occur is the radiation of an additional gluon. So if you have any questions in between, just feel free to interrupt me. And uh, uh, there's a nice property of this cross-section. It factorizes. So the differential cross-section of this QQ bar going to glue is proportional to the cross-section of uh, QQ bar uh, times some function. And this function will um, uh, describe the radiation pattern of the gluon from this process. And this is only the most divergent uh, contributions here, the dominant contributions, and we see here that it depends on the angle between quark and gluon. This is the sine square theta here. And it also depends on the energy fraction that the gluon uh, gets in a splitting here. This is Z. And we see that for both for collinear configurations where this gluon is um, emitted uh, in line with the quark or the anti-quark, this will diverge. And also, if the energy that the gluon takes away vanishes, so if we emit very soft gluons, this will diverge. And um, what we want to do is we want to find a general description of emission from uh, individual legs. So this is uh, emission from this combined uh, quark-anti-quark dipole. So what we can do is we can artificially separate this term here into two independent collinear uh, contributions. So this 2 over sine square theta can be written as 1 over 1 minus cosine theta plus 1 over 1 plus cosine theta. And then if we define the angle between gluon and anti-quark as theta tilde, then we can write this uh, in this symmetric form here. And uh, what we get then is two contributions, one that diverges for a collinear um, emission uh, with the quark and one that diverges for a collinear emission with the anti-quark. So um, then we can write this factorized cross-section as uh, so the differential cross-section of QQ bar glue as the product of the cross-section of QQ bar times a sum of all the partons that can radiate uh, and then individual uh, splitting functions. And here I also approximated the cosine, uh, the, the theta to be small. So uh, one minus cosine turns into uh, theta square half. And um, uh, this here, this theta, that will eventually turn out to be the evolution variable in which uh, parton showers operate. But this is not unique. So in this derivation, this is uh, an angle. But um, in general, we can pick different evolution variables. So I will call them rho in general. And uh, popular choices are also the virtuality of an off-shell propagator, which is defined as something proportional to this angle. So it's z, 1 minus z times theta square e square. And it's also, uh, we can also use the transverse momentum, which is given by z square, 1 minus z square, theta square e square. And um, this differential here, this d ln theta, or d ln q square, so d theta square over theta square, they'll be the same. 
That's why these uh, equations work for different um, ordering variables. And uh, this structure is completely general, so I'll not show the details here, but actually these divergent contributions here for soft collinear configurations, they, uh, they are uh, correct for all uh, processes that involve uh, external partons. So we can, uh, in general, write a cross-section uh, with an additional parton emission as a product of the cross-section without it times the sum of all partons and then the um, radiation function of uh, additional partons. And these uh, functions here, in general, we'll call it P, will um, uh, sum all the allowed configurations, all the allowed splittings. And these are, as I said, universal, but they, in general, depend on the azimuthal angle of the emission. But then, usually, when you implement it in a parton shower, uh, the spin average functions are used. So uh, you average over the azimuthal angle to get the uh, whole rate correct, but then sample the angle <laughs> Um, uh, in a flat matter. So the inclusive uh, probability of having an emission is this term integrated from some uh, minimal scale to some maximal scale. And there's also limits on this splitting variable Z. This was the energy fraction of the gluon, which will depend on the ordering variable. I'll talk about that as well. And these functions are uh, in QCD. These are the dominant contributions. They are actually uh, just given by these. So uh, the one that I was already talking about, the emission of an additional gluon from a quark line, looks like this. And uh, we notice here, again, that uh, for soft gluons, this is divergent. And for collinear configurations due to this formula, it is divergent as well. Then um, the, by symmetry, the uh, probability of emitting a quark from a quark uh, also splitting off a gluon. So instead of taking the energy fraction of the gluon, we just take the energy fraction of the quark in this case. This is, uh, of course, the same by symmetry. Then we have a, a high probability of having glue to glue glue splittings. Um, so this is symmetric, at you, as you would expect, in the energy fraction of the gluon, since it should diverge for both the gluons if they uh, become soft. And then finally, there's a subleading contribution that is the splitting of a gluon into a quark pair, but there's no soft divergence here. So we will have a collinear enhancement of this splitting, but there will be no soft enhancement, which means that in the parton shower, this contribution is less important than the uh, emission of gluons. So let's have a closer look at these emission probabilities. And just for the sake of the argument, I'll assume a PT ordered uh, evolution here. So the inclusive uh, emission probability is um, the integral over the, uh, the PT scale from some minimum to some maximum value. And then um, also the integral over the, um, the energy fraction of the gluon. And um, the energy fraction of the gluon in a splitting it has a lower and an upper limit just uh, from the fact that the energy fraction that a gluon carries away cannot be smaller than its transverse momentum. Okay, so this z min will be pt over e, and by symmetry z max is one minus z min, and um, this has then a probabilistic interpretation. As I said, it's just the probability of emitting a parton with, uh, within this pt range and within this energy fraction range. And if we integrate over this, so for gluon emission, we will have a 1 over z dependence here in the splitting kernel. And if we integrate first over z, taking these, uh, these limits into account, and then over pt, we will, uh, in general, find a double log configuration. So um, this will be proportional to alpha s, and then a log square of some high scale, that is of the order of the maximum pt here, over some minimal scale that is usually chosen of, uh, on the order of uh, heterogenization, so lambda QCD. And if we write uh, this logarithm as just L, and we allow for successive emissions, so we uh, emit a gluon, then we take the configuration and allow for another emission of a gluon, and so on and so on. We attach gluons all over. Then what we will find is that the cross-section of some process plus n gluons on top of it will be the cross-section of this process times alpha s to the n, so one power of alpha s for every splitting that happens, times a dominant logarithmic contribution coming from these double logs, so l to the 2n with some coefficient, 
And then there will also be sub-leading contributions. And these, the partner chart doesn't necessarily get correct. But the soft and collinear emission pattern that is in this very first and dominant term, that will be correct um, as described by the partner chart. So this is called the double logarithm. And um, another crucial ingredient to a parton show is also no emission probabilities. So we are not only interested in uh, looking at the emission uh, spectrum that you get naively from uh, matrix element corrections. Yeah. Previous slide, yes. Sorry? So in the uh, uh, in the cross section difference of cross section plus plus uh, Yeah. You are saying that only the C part and delta part part and that's the one which is discriminated. Yeah. So what's the order of error in uh, that depends on your configuration. I mean, uh, basically, this is good for soft and <coughs> collinear configurations because that's where these functions are derived from. But actually, the uh, error that you get can be uh, pretty large if you if you have wide angle emissions. So it depends on the configuration, also on the process. OK, so another crucial ingredient to a parton show is no emission probabilities. We are not only interested in the emission spec spectrum, but uh, what we want to do is start at a high scale and then find the hardest emission, then split this, uh, the parton configuration at this hardest emission scale and go on from there to find further emissions. So what we need to find is the probability of splitting in the case that we don't have a splitting before. So that's the general picture, and that's why we need no emission probabilities and emission probabilities as ingredients to a part on shower. And um, uh, in order to talk about probabilities in this context, it's useful to introduce some resolution criterion, uh, rho larger than rho min. So if we ask for soft and collinear radiation, since these patterns are divergent, we will always find one, basically. So um, what we do instead is we define some cutoff, and then we get a finite answer. So virtual and unresolved uh, emissions will be finite, and resolved uh, contributions will be finite, and resolved will be finite. And then to find the no emission probabilities, we can um, uh, start from unitarity. So we ask for probability conservation. So the no emission probability should be 1 minus the emission probability. That's what a pattern shower should do. It should either emit or not. So if we have a um, multiplicative, um, uh, so we have a multiplicative evolution, the no emission probability from the maximum to the minimum scale, uh, we can also write as a product of the no emission probability from the maximum to some scale, and then from some scale down to the minimal scale. And this splitting of no emission probabilities we can do uh, in arbitrarily many steps. So if we uh, do it, we get a product of no emission probabilities for small slices in the phase space of allowed emissions. And then we can use this constraint here and ask for this no emission probability differentially to correspond to 1 minus the inclusive <laughs> emission probability. But then we get the product of a, a 1 minus something small. We can write this as an exponential of minus a sum <coughs> of these contributions. And then taking this limit, this will end up being an integral over the inclusive emission probabilities. So the no emission probability is uh, the exponential of minus the emission probabilities. And this uh, sounds familiar from the case of radioactive decay. So you can only have a decay if um, a parton hasn't decayed before. And there you also got this uh, proportionality of, an, if, um, of the emission uh, to the um, no emission probability. So this gives you this exponential. Um, so in a parton show, we need to implement emission and no emission probabilities. The emission probability is given by this expression, the no emission probability by this one. And then what we actually want to do is to find the hardest splitting scale. So the probability of uh, parton i splitting, having its hardest splitting at rho follows the Poisson statistics. It's given by the differential inclusive emission probability at some scale times the no emission probability above. So the first emission can only occur if it didn't occur earlier. So this will be the main ingredient to a parton shower. And these no emission probabilities are also called Sudakov vectors. And uh, I'll often write it as a delta between two scales, row one and row two. So um, just to repeat this, 
The question that we are asking in the emission rate is a little bit different in the case of this expression we derived from a matrix element, so this cross-section, what we started from, and in a part on shower. So in a matrix element, uh, you would uh, find the inclusive radiation pattern. But in a parton show, you ask for the scale of the hardest emission. So the Sudakov factor will then regulate this as compared to the divergent emission spectrum here. Because if you uh, include the probability of not having had a splitting before, this will no longer diverge, but it will turn around. Because at some point, it's quite likely that you had a splitting at a higher scale. Uh, so this will finally go down again. This is then this typical Sudakov peak structure. And uh, however, if we forget about this constraint of not having emissions at higher scales, so we allow for 0, 1, 2, 3, or any number of emissions above, we forget about the no emission probability. So in the repeated soft emission of gluons, we will actually recover this uh, spectrum that we started from naively. But um, there's complications in reality, because the parton shower does more than just sampling this. So whenever you allow for splitting, you will uh, conserve energy and momentum. You will do some recall adjustment. And there will also be new splittings being possible. If you emitted one gluon, then suddenly it's not only the quark line that can emit gluons, but you will also get a, the gluon contribution that might split. So in, uh, in reality, this is a little bit more complicated. Um, yeah, but this is the general picture. So let's have a look at this no emission probability, the pseudo uh, factor. And uh, if we expand it in the orders of the strong coupling, what you see is that due to the fact that it's an exponential, it contains uh, factors of all orders of alpha s. But this is the probability of nothing happening, right? So it's not that we generate any emissions here. This is the probability of not having emissions. So this corresponds to no changes in state, which means it's actually an approximation for virtual corrections but it includes uh, divergent terms in all orders of alpha s, containing these double logarithms that I was talking about earlier. And uh, yeah, so this corresponds to the first order virtual correction, an approximation of the first order virtual correction. This corresponds to the approximation of the second order virtual correction, and so on, going to all orders of alpha s. Um, so coming back to this aspect of unitarity of a parton shower, so, so we started from the constraint that the no emission probability should be 1 minus the emission probability um, differentially. So if we have a look at the probability of the hardest emission being somewhere, this is what a parton shower actually uses, then if we integrate over the total allowed range of emission scales here, um, then we have this emission uh, probability times the no emission probability above the scale of the splitting that occurs. And since the exponential in this here is just the same as the emission function here, we can write this as a derivative. And suddenly, this integral is very easy. We will just get uh, two exponentials of integrals, one between just the highest scale, so this will vanish, and one between the minimal and the maximal scale. And now, if we go to an unphysical and extreme case where we say we have uh, infinite resolution and we can actually observe collinear and soft emissions, then we could send this uh, uh, evolution variable, the PT, for example, all the way to zero, which would give us this x to the minus infinity vanishes, and we'll just end up with one. So if we allow for emissions in the full phase space going down to arbitrarily low scales, the partner shower would just give us an emission somewhere. Might be early, might be late, but there will be one emission. So, uh, but in a physical context, we usually don't, uh, we can't uh, resolve these soft and collinear emissions. So usually you would be interested in a configuration where you have a finite resolution. And then if we don't go to zero here, but to something finite, then this will be smaller than one. And what the parton shower does then is it takes part of your cross section and reinterprets it as, uh, as this cross-section plus additional emissions. But there's also a finite uh, probability then, if this doesn't go to this uh, divergence here, that nothing happens, right? It might be small if you have a huge um, phase space, but uh, there's a finite probability of nothing happening. <coughs> so how would uh, parton shower actually be uh, constructed? Uh, based on this. So there's one uh, algorithm that almost all parton showers use, so all modern parton showers use. This is the Sudakov-Vito algorithm. Uh, 
And I will not discuss it in detail, I'll just give you a small glimpse. If you want to read details, there's one reference, but it's a, it's a many references. So um, if you have a process with n external partons at some resolution scale rho 1, and uh, you want to evolve this system in a parton shower language, so you want to uh, find further emissions that address this state, um, then one observation you can make is that the pseudocore factor, uh, factors factorize, actually. So the no emission probability from two legs in this state is just the no emission probability from one leg times the no emission probability from the other leg. And then you have different allowed splittings for gluons, for example. They could split in a pair, into a pair of gluons, but they could also split into a pair of quark and a quark. So summing over these possibilities, um, taking the product over the no emission probabilities of these individual allowed channels will give you the no emission probability from one parton. And then what a parton shower does is uh, use the pseudocov veto algorithm to find the scale of the uh, uh, subsequent emissions. So you start by proposing some scale using an overestimate of the splitting kernel that behaves nice in an analytic way. So you can integrate it, invert it, and sample a row from it for each of the allowed splittings of each parton. Then you determine a winner parton, and you select a splitting variable according to the same overestimate. And then you would accept this splitting with the probability of the correct emission rate divided by the overestimate that you used and then continue sampling from that scale. And if you happen to accept an emission, so basically this is just a hit or miss uh, Monte Carlo, and if you happen to accept this emission, you will construct the full splitting kinematics, so you will sample an azimuthal angle, you'll uh, sample your color configuration, and um, yeah, set up this splitting, and then you will uh, iterate this process until you reach some predefined cutoff in the partnership evolution. So um, this was all in the world of final state. We started from E plus E minus going to QQ bar plus additional QCD radiation. But of course, we are interested in PP collisions. And there, we also have initial state radiation. And uh, this is, again, the master formula for the LHC. So um, the hadronic cross section of the scattering <coughs> of partons A and B going to N final state partons is given by the sum of the partons that you could extract from a, a uh, from a hadron. Then you have the integral over these uh, momentum fractions here. Then the PDFs giving you the probability of finding uh, a parton with a given momentum fraction. And then uh, the differential partonic cross section. So the hard scattering is encoded in this piece. And all the uh, soft and collinear stuff going on is encoded in these probabilities of excluding or extracting a parton from uh, the hadron. And in initial state radiation, we need to take these into account. Because if we happen to uh, allow for initial state um, splitting, then we will actually change this momentum fraction that we uh, extract from the hadron. Right? So we need to apply some ratio of PDFs to take into account this change in uh, momentum flux, basically. And uh, the equations governing this uh, behavior, the uh, scaling of these um, PDFs, is given by the d glove equations. And I'll just uh, show this uh, short um, illustration of how it works. So this is an evolution equation in, in some measure of hardness. And uh, the probability of finding a quark at a given uh, energy fraction in a hadron is given by the probability of having a splitting of a quark to quark glue at some higher fraction. Uh, of momentum, or the splitting of a gluon into a quark pair at some higher fraction of momentum. And th so this is a system of uh, coupled differential equation that describes the uh, ensemble of parton content in uh, hadrons. So for the gluon case, for example, this would be given by the probability of having a quark splitting into a gluon and the probability of a gluon splitting into a gluon at some higher momentum uh, fraction. And this basically corresponds to an evolution equation from low to high scales. So experimentally, you can determine the partonic content of your hadron at some low scale, and then use this uh, system of differential equations to evolve this um, system to uh, higher resolution scales. 
And uh, in a parton shower, in initial state radiation, we need to modify the emission and no emission probabilities to include these PDFs. So we go back to the emission and no emission probabilities. And uh, so what we will do uh, following these equations is uh, interpreting the change of uh, this PDF as the um, probability of having an emission. And then by doing some calculus, you find that you have this uh, ratio of PDFs here. And so we need to incorporate this in the emission and no emission probabilities, both of them. And then what initial state um, showers do uh, is basically reproduce the DGLUB equations backwards. So by generating splittings in a parton shower in the initial state, you reproduce this uh, resolution that the DGLUB equation gives you. But the crucial difference in initial state radiation is that we would want to start from the hard process of interest. So you define some proce process that you are interested in, you apply PDFs to get the cross section, and then to dress this with initial state radiation, you move backwards towards the hadron and find the um, probabilities uh, that, the pro uh, that this additional radiation happened. Uh, but it's very crucial that this now is backwards. It goes from high scales to low scales. And um, yeah, the next topic I would like to talk about is color coherence. So um, the emission of soft gluons uh, comes uh, into play here. So uh, soft gluons uh, have a large wavelength. And then if they are emitted at a large angle compared to some uh, color dipole configuration, then physically it doesn't make sense that they, um, that they resolve the color configuration of this uh, dipole here. So what should happen instead with large wavelength gluons that are emitted at a large angle is that they are only sensitive to the combined color configuration of the system. And this, in practice, leads to destructive interference outside the cone that is uh, defined by the opening angle of this dipole. And there's different ways to incorporate this in uh, pattern showers. So um, the first way is to use angular ordering. So instead of just going to lower energies, you successively also go to lower angles to avoid these uh, wide angle soft emissions. Um, if you have a virtuality ordered or PT ordered shower, you can also have additional ordering constraints. But these are then usually only approximations for this coherence. Or you can use dipole showers, which I'll talk about. So um, these are some very, very old plots from PP bar collisions showing this effect of color coherence. And in the very, very old version of Pythia that didn't have the proper um, the proper vetoes on uh, soft wide angle emissions, you see that uh, in the in three jet events, in the rapidity spectrum of the third jet here, there's way too much activity in the central region corresponding to these uh, soft wide angle emissions. And introducing this additional veto in a virtuality order shower, this is what Pythia was at that time, uh, the data is reproduced uh, nicely. And Herwig, using an angular ordering, does an even better job here. So um, this was all starting from collinear factorization, both in the hadronic case, so the hadronic cross-section, that was the uh, collinear factorization formula, and also the splitting that we started from was in the collinear limit, assuming small angles. But another thing you could do is to assume that the radiation, the radiated gluon is soft. And in this case, you get a factorization as well, but the radiation function looks a little bit different. So omega is the energy of the gluon here. Then we have the solid angle element and some antenna functions, as they are called. And they are given by this expression. So 1 minus the cosine of the angle between quark and antiquark divided by 1 minus cosine of the angle between quark and gluon and the angle between the antiquark and the gluon here. And uh, as we did it in the collinear limit, we can uh, split these into two terms that are only divergent for one of the uh, possible emitters. And then we get dipole terms. So we can split this antenna function into two parts defined in this way. And these will only be divergent for one of the collinear configurations. And then if you perform an azimuthal integration, so you take the individual legs, you integrate over the, um, over the azimuthal angle of the gluon emission, you find that, um, that the, you get the non-zero probability of emitting when you're inside the cone 
that is defined by the opening angle of this dipole, but it's just zero outside. So there's no soft gluon emission uh, at large angles in this dipole configuration. And uh, well, I talked a lot about ordering variables. So we have different choices that we can make. So in the plane of PT and rapidity, so this is the phase space of a possible emission, um, we could have a virtuality ordering. This was inspired by uh, initial state radiation that we have a hardness that we evolve in. We need these hardness scales to take PDF ratios. So um, this was well motivated in the case of ISR. Then we saw that an angular ordering is useful in the context of coherence to get the soft gluon radiation right. This would look like this in this plane. And a very <laughs> modern choice, so most modern uh, event generators, uh, parton showers use a PT ordering. That's also, uh, that's like a compromise. It has the hardness, but it also gets some coherence effects right. And um, so we want to get this hard ordering, basically, to be able to model these uh, ratios of PDFs in the initial state. And we want to get color coherence right. And what we could do, instead of using the DGLAB kernels that I started from, is actually just use this radiation pattern of soft gluons instead. This is then called dipole and antenna showers, where the radiation function is exchanged for this soft emission uh, approximation. So um, I'll talk about kinematics of splittings a little bit. So if we assume that a parton A uh, splits into partons B and C, then we want to consider four momentum conservation in this branching. So if we define a PT uh, to be uh, orthogonal, uh, to be defined with um, uh, a reference axis of the direction of A, then we see immediately that the PT of parton C must balance the PT of parton B. So these two will be opposite to each other. And then we can define light cone momenta. So this is uh, E plus some um, energy plus some longitudinal momentum along this axis, or E minus this longitudinal uh, momentum. We call this P plus and P minus. And due to the additivity of uh, energies and momenta, this will also be additive. So P plus minus of A will be P plus minus of B plus P plus minus of C. And instead of using energy fractions for, the, for describing the softness of the emitted gluons, we can also use light cone momentum fractions. So um, we would define the Z that we had earlier to be the ratio of P plus B and P plus A, and then P plus C will be 1 minus Z times P plus A. So this is a slightly different um, definition, but it's similar enough. And uh, then we can use P plus, P minus, which will just be E square minus PL square. And by the on-shell condition, this will be M square plus PT square with respect to this reference axis here. And applying some math, we find a formula that relates the masses and the PT in this system. So the mass of part on A will be given by the mass of part on B divided by this light cone momentum fraction plus the mass of part on C divided by 1 minus C and the PT divided by the product of C1 minus C. And now in an initial state and a final state shower, um, what we do is actually quite different. So we want on-shell uh, momenta, on-shell external momenta in every step of the evolution. In a final state, that means that the mass of B and C, partons B and C, should be zero. So if we assume we are at high enough energies that we can neglect the quark masses, and what we find then from this formula is that the mass A square is PT square over Z1 minus Z. So this is where the PT definition at the first slide came from. And this will be larger than zero. And if we have a four momentum squared, so if this is the virtuality, if we are not on shell, this, uh, uh, we have a, a four momentum squared. And four vectors squared that are larger than zero are called time-like. That's why the final state showers are also called time showers. But if we are in an initial state, it might actually be part on B that is connected to some hard process, and A coming from some hadron. And then we would like to be A and C on shell, and B might have some virtuality. And in this case, so setting MA and MC to zero, we get a different definition for PT. So uh, MB square would be minus PT square over one minus C. And now this is smaller than zero, corresponding to a space-like vector. And uh, 
Yeah, so this is why initial state radiation is also, uh, initial state showers are then also called space-like showers. Um, so I mentioned energy momentum conservation already, and one crucial observation, that's why I wanted to have this uh, equation here, is that if we set all masses here on shell, so set all to zero, that means that the PT of the splitting must be zero. But we want to generate higher PTs also in splitting, so we must allow uh, these patterns to go off shell. But since we uh, set them on shell in every step of the evolution, that means that we need some sort of recoil scheme to allow for these off shell nests after splittings. That means this one to two branching that I talked about here is uh, not really possible for non vanishing PTs. We need to take other patterns to absorb some sort of kinematic recoil to allow every pattern to be on shell after the splitting. And there's different choices that you can make. Basically, there's many choices in pattern showers, and I tried to touch upon many of them. So there's different choices you can do. You can do a global recoil scheme where you just rescale all the other momenta that you have in some patonic configuration. Or you can do a local recoil scheme where you identify a proper partner, parton, maybe a color-connected one that forms a dipole with the emitter, and then this can absorb the recoil. This would be called a dipole recoil scheme, and it's basically equivalent to a, a system where you don't distinguish between an uh, emitter and a spectator, which is called an antenna configuration then. And um, this momentum conservation that we implement in pattern showers in every step is uh, an advantage compared to analytical resummation tools because it allows for fully exclusive predictions. So every parton at every step of the evolution, the external partons will be on shell. And this also allows for systematic replacements with matrix elements uh, to improve the description that a parton shower does. This is matching merging, what I will talk about in the afternoon. And uh, the ambiguities in the choice of the recoil scheme lead to some uncertainty. So uh, there will be differences in different implementations in different parton showers. So going back to dipole and antenna showers, I said this would be based on this uh, dipole uh, or antenna emission, uh, these dipole antenna emission functions. And then modern uh, implementations of the shower often use uh, NLO subtraction methods of fixed order cross sections as inspiration because these uh, subtraction methods they are used to, uh, to get uh, finite um, predictions for the virtual corrections and real emission patterns. I will not talk about this in detail, but what they actually do is they include these divergent contributions that we need for a pattern shower, and they also provide a two to three phase space mapping that is very useful to uh, implement a recoil. And uh, these are usually, um, but not necessarily, ordered in transverse momentum, uh, but the actual choice of the transverse momentum uh, variable that they are ordered in depends on how you define the reference axis and how you actually set up the kinematics. So basically every part and show that is uh, defined as ordered in some transverse momentum will actually have a different definition of transverse momentum. And just to make this clear, so dipole showers, if people talk about dipole showers, they usually mean um, dipole uh, emission functions but um, there's also this dipole recoil, and this dipole recoil you could implement in a D-glub shower. That is what Pythia does, for example. So you don't need these dipole emission functions uh, to have a dipole-like recoil. So another important ingredient to part on showers is the running coupling. We saw already that the initial state radiation includes ratios of PDFs that are uh, dependent on some scale, but uh, the alpha S is also dependent on an uh, on a evolution scale. So uh, you all know this, um, going to lower uh, scales, the alpha S becomes large, and leads to confinement at some point. So we have a low pole here where the coupling diverges. And this means actually that if we allow for scale dependent alpha S in the emission function, we can't go all the way down to zero. Well, this is logarithmic, so zero is somewhere there. Uh, but we need to cut off the evolution um, at some finite value. Okay, and this corresponds to a value above the scale at which hadronization happens and perturbative theory breaks down, basically. And uh, this also leads to a lot of uh, radiation in the soft regime because the radiation is proportional to alpha s, but alpha s becomes large in a soft configuration. So this will actually uh, lead to many, 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 many more soft gluons being emitted. Yeah, and the cutoff of our shower, as I said, becomes some physical relevance here. <coughs> 
um, due to this Landau pool that needs to be avoided. So a small summary of the perturbative ambiguities that we encounter when building a pattern shower. So there's many choices we make. We choose an evolution variable, so that could be the uh, virtuality of a propagator, the PT, or an angular ordering. And this affects the scales in which we evolve the parton shower. Then we have a choice of phase space mapping. This is basically the recoil that we use. Then we have uh, um, the choice of radiation functions, and that could be the collinear limit, so using DGLUB, or we use the soft limit of dipole or antenna radiation functions. And uh, just to be clear, in the uh, most dominant region where radiation is uh, pretty collinear and soft, these are both good approximations. Then we choose some uh, renormalization scale mu r. So this uh, refers to the reference value of alpha s that we are using. But it, uh, it also points at the freedom of choice of the, um, of the scale at which we evaluate alpha s in the evolution of the shower. So a popular choice here is the PT, because it happens to be a good choice. If you look at the next to leading order effects, uh, that's why most modern showers are PT ordered. Then we can also choose starting and ending scales for our shower. And this will, uh, the starting scale will correspond to phase space constraints, and this ending scale will correspond to some heteronization scale, where we hand over this uh, colored partonic system to a mechanism that renders it uh, color neutral. And uh, we also need to uh, handle the color configuration and the azimuthal correlations in some way. But as I said, uh, these are often averaged. And uh, I didn't talk about color configurations, but there are simplifications done here as well. So um, yeah, there's uncertainties based on these choices. Uh, but these ambiguities can be reduced by using additional perturbative QCD input. And that is, again, matching and merging, and what I will talk about in the second lecture. So a small overview of publicly available parton showers. This includes Sherpa, Herwig, and Pythia, but also some others. Um, just to, to illustrate what choices are made. So one of the first dipole showers, any plus or minus that was, was Ariadne with some dipole PT ordering. The splitting variable was not an energy or momentum fraction, but it was rapidity. And coherence is uh, enforced by using, uh, not enforced, the coherence is achieved by using um, antenna, the antenna radiation pattern. Then Herwig has its angular order shower to get the coherence right, and it uses energy fractions, used energy fractions as a splitting variable. Then later versions of Herwig use a modified uh, angular order shower with Leica momentum fractions, but still uh, coherence by angular ordering. And they also implement a, a PT ordered Catani Simo dipole shower with Leica momentum fractions. Um, then for Pythia, it started off being a virtuality order shower in old versions. But in later versions, so Pythia 8, we have a PT ordered shower with energy fractions as a splitting variable. And coherence in the initial state must be enforced by some cuts. And then Sherpa started out with a virtuality ordered shower, similar to the one that Pythia used. But they changed to a Katani Simo dipole shower. And I put primes on this dipole PT just to illustrate that the choices of PT that you actually do when implementing these showers can be different. So just to point out some developments in the context of parton showers, so there's basically two directions in which you could go. You could improve the seed cross sections that you start the parton shower from, and this corresponds to the matching and merging that I will talk about. So uh, corrections by implementing additional matrix elements for the uh, hard emissions corresponds to merging, and combining higher order matrix elements with parton showers corresponds to matching. Uh, but you can also do improvements in the parton shower itself without matching to external input. And this corresponds, uh, for example, to the treatment of subleading color terms that are often neglected. Then you can include higher order splitting functions to get a next to leading log correct shower. So that refers to your question. To, to get these subleading terms correct, you could try to just go to higher perturbative orders in the emission probabilities in the shower. And what you typically get then is, uh, it's a little weird, you get one to three splitting functions suddenly if you go up one order in alpha s. So you could have a quark splitting into a q, q, q bar or into a q glue glue. But you also get uh, corrected one to two splitting functions, order alpha s then, that's like a virtual correction on the splitting function. Uh, 
Uh, but obviously, uh, this is prone to double counting. So if you have two successive one to two splittings, you will have a one to three splitting and you make, need to make sure that you don't double count contributions when doing this. So that is something that people work on in the context of Daya and Vincia. And there's also uh, efforts to get the asymmetrical corrections, so the spin correlations in the shower right. So um, do I have some minutes left? So uh, just to talk a little bit about heteronization. So when we are done with the parton shower evolution, we will have collimated uh, jets of colored partons, quarks and gluons, basically. Um, but at larger distances, as they fly towards the detector, at some scale, they will start heteronizing. So when the distance between colored charges becomes large, they need to neutralize somehow, because that's what we observe in the end. And um, I'll talk briefly about the Lund string heteronization, and this is based on the potential uh, between two color charges. And this is the separation of two color charges. This is the potential. So if you start off with very small separations, this potential looks like uh, Coulomb potential, so it's rather free partons. That's what we have at high scales and hard scattering processes. But then if we uh, go to larger separations of color, um, of color charges, it actually turns into a linear potential. And a linear potential means that the force that we need to apply to pull apart color charges is constant, which means that the energy in this system will be larger and larger and larger. So this is uh, quenched QCD simulations. This just goes on forever. But the, um, the system that forms here between the partons looks like a string. That is where this uh, string model, what this string model is based on. Uh, and in real QCD, where you um, include uh, fermion effects, then um, what happens is actually that these strings between uh, color charges uh, can break. So instead of this linear potential going to high scales here, you will have a saturation because if you reach enough energy in the string configuration, it will just uh, break into a new QQ bar pair uh, with opposite colors to form two subsystems. And this is what the uh, Lund heteronization is based on. So if you have a, a QQ bar pair with opposite color charges that move apart along the Z and minus Z direction, we plot this in the ZT plane, then they move along light cone, the light cones, and at some point, the energy that is uh, in this uh, string configuration will be large enough to form new pairs of uh, quark antiquarks, also pairs of diquarks. And this is how uh, mesons and baryons are produced then in this context. And if we look at the kinematic picture um, of these splittings, so uh, then basically strings are stretched between quarks and anti-quarks. But if we assume that gluons uh, carry two color charges, it's a slight sim simplification, what we see then is that these uh, strings are stretched uh, with gluons on it. So it is stretched between a quark-antiquark pair and uh, along the string, we will have gluons. And um, this heteronization model is actually um, uh, infrared safe because um, emissions of collinear and soft gluons will not affect the string kinematics. So short words about tuning. So we saw that we made a lot of choices in the construction of a part on shower, but there's not too many free parameters left. So basically, the two important parameters in parton showers is the value of alpha s that you choose for the splittings. <laughs> it's like tuning the emission functions and the cutoff at which you stop the evolution. But the non-perturbative heteronization models, so the string heteronization model uh, and the cluster heteronization model that is used in Herwig and Sherpa, they come with a lot of parameters to get the uh, flavor composition right, to get the kinetic picture right. And uh, we need to optimize these parameters uh, based on well-measured data to get good descriptions with parton showers. So this is just an illustration of the tuning of Pythia, the Pythia's uh, string heteronization model to be specific, uh, based on the charged multiplicity in E plus E minus collisions. And I just want to illustrate how much of an effect it has to play around with these parameters a little bit. So um, the, nowadays, the p default tune of Pythia is the Monash tune, and this is the old default tune. And there's quite an enhancement in the quality of data description by uh, tuning the parameters of the model. So how is tuning done? So basically, you generate a Monte Carlo, um, a Monte Carlo pseudo data based on some choice of parameters. And then you compare to experimentally measured data. 
And uh, naively, you might think you want to run the pattern show at one uh, parameter point, and then you see, is my uh, description of the data good or bad? You move a little bit in parameter space, and you do it again and see if it improves. Successive improvement. But this is very inefficient because it takes a long while to uh, run Monte Carlo event generators to sufficient statistics. So what you usually do instead is you uh, run it uh, in parallel for a lot of parameter points in your uh, parameter space. And then you parameterize your Monte Carlo uh, generator response uh, based on the observables in the parameter space. So if you have one observable, just one bin in some diagram, it will depend on, depend on the parameters. And uh, yeah, based on this, you can optimize the choice of parameters using just a chi-square uh, measure, usually. And uh, this brings me to my summary. So we started from a soft collinear limit and saw that uh, QCD cross-section is factorized there. And the divergent terms of these splitting probabilities are universal. They do not uh, depend on the process of, uh, of interest. And then pattern showers are not only based on emission uh, probabilities, but also no emission probabilities. So inclusive, uh, um, inclusive predictions are turned into exclusive predictions. We ask how many emissions do we have exactly, not uh, where might we have an emission plus additional emissions. Then we have different ways of ordering it. We have uh, modern pattern showers based mainly of antenna and dipole showers. And there are many improvements built into these pattern shows, for example, momentum conservation and running scales. But there are clearly some effects that a pattern shower cannot get right, being based on soft and collinear approximation. So that is where we need matching and merging. And uh, further ingredients for the full generation of events uh, will then also be heteronization, which I only talked briefly about, and also these multi-pattern interactions, beam remnants, heteron decays, rescattering, and other ingredients that I didn't cover, just be aware. So, thanks.